Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. I'm Whitney, host of the Real Estate Syndication Show. Every day I'm interviewing experts that will help you to successfully invest in or grow your syndication business. Hit the like and subscribe button so you'll be on track to learn from the best in the industry. Happening on January 20th and 21st is Denver's biggest real estate event, the next big thing. And it's shaking up how real estate professionals will define business success. This two-day event will give you tools so you can catapult your own business. You'll discuss how the world is changing and what's needed to stay two steps ahead. Together with 450 other professionals, you will build a foundation to become the next big thing. Built on the foundation of helping others build wealth through real estate, the Ruth team has created the ultimate tool that is this event, and it's called the next big thing. 25 speakers, including Ryan Serhant, Kenyon Salo, Nebu Hata, Stacey Veden, Brian Moses, Natalie Davis, and Ryan Avery. Register now at the next big thing Colorado.com and use the code RESS to get $150 off. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, David Robinson. Today, our guest is Brian Schaefer. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, David. Glad to be here, and it's an honor to be invited. So Brian is a 40-year-old real estate investor out of Wapello, Iowa. He started with single-family homes, then immediately scratched that idea once he learned about multifamily. And after building a team, he was able to close their first deal this past February, which is a 42-unit building and plans to close on 37 more at the beginning of 2022. So Brian, I'm excited to dive into your story today to learn a little bit more about how you went about you know, making this transition into the multifamily space and how you built up your team that enabled you to go and, and acquire your first commercial multifamily deal. So why don't we back up to start and tell us a little bit about your background and how you ultimately got into the real estate space. Yeah. So like you said, I was born and raised in Wapala, Iowa. It's a small town in Southeast Iowa, about 2,600. So as you can imagine, a small town, everybody knows who you are. My brother has had a construction company since about 1998, I think. And off and on, I was kind of in and out working with him, building houses together. I built the house that I'm in here right now. I actually pretty much just finished it up and it's taken me about four years. So my background runs pretty deep in construction. That's where I get a lot of uh, knowledge from being able to inspect apartment buildings and things of that nature. So that's where I started knowing a little bit about real estate, having that background. And then from that point on, it really just became about, you know, doing other jobs that I wasn't really satisfied with always kind of led back to construction. So I've always had an interest in real estate and and building homes, but there was always something bigger kind of looming in the background. I just could never really figure out what it was. So I spent a lot of blurry years just, you know, bouncing here and there doing things that was really unsatisfied with and got involved in some uh, sprint car racing, met some great people. And I would say that would be a, the next step that we could probably talk about is uh, where that really took me. Cause that was the key was being surrounded by the, the right people. And I started noticing kind of a common thread and that really just made me think that real estate's something that I have to do. And when you say that you were surrounded by the right people, what does that mean? Well, I remember who was it? Jim Rohn that said you become the sum of the five people you hang out with the most. That isn't something that I heard until probably in the last three years. And I completely understand all the that stuff because it, it applies. I mean, these are things I was thinking about long before I started listening to any of those things, but I had a crazy desire to race sprint cars uh, with the World of Outlaw Tour professionally. And that was really my ultimate dream was to do that. So I, there was a guy that I knew that was really good locally. I went down there, I think uh, like 22,000 and just asked him to teach me, Hey, I want to learn sprint cars. You're the best in the area. Can you teach me? And, and he, you know, he said, yeah, um, I actually almost left and decided not to ask him because I was kind of scared. But so he took me under his wing and was teaching me, you know, a lot about sprint cars. I'll fast forward a little bit. He's now my brother-in-law. So he's, he's, 
he's in the family. And then when I moved to Des Moines, I got involved. That was when I got the first call to actually go work on a sprint car for money. So somebody was going to mm. pay me. And when I went down there, we went to Mesquite, Texas. I rode with a family down there that was a competitor of ours at the time who I didn't really have a relationship with. And, you know, to fast forward again, after I came back from that trip, I went with a very uh, notable driver at the time and was helping him. And just being around those people, it had such an impact on me when I got back. And then that kind of leaped me into getting tied up with some other teams locally here in Iowa that raced on the Word of Outlaw circuit. So these are professional teams now. And let me ask you about that. You you mentioned that, you know, being around those people had such an impact on you when you got back. What was it about the interaction with those people that had an impact on you? It was really, a lot of it was just how generous they were. You know, when you feel, when somebody on such a high stage can look at you who's just, you know, you're, you're just, I'm just a no at the time. It's just a no, I'm just somebody here and they do so much for you. And they're, they're just, they're generous and they don't, they don't really need you, but they give you their time and they're willing to talk to you outside of racing. And one of my, a guy that I'm close, very close with today is, is a guy that I spent a lot of time in my young years watching on TV. So that it's like these steps. It went from a brother-in-law to this uh, locally uh, notable driver into the World of Outlaw Tour. And then once I got there, that's when things really started to change. I was involved in a lot of conversations with some very wealthy people mm. just sitting in the same race car, in the lounge of the race car hauler. And real estate was a common topic. Didn't It didn't hit me though back then. It wasn't something that I thought I got to do real estate. This stuff just kept getting in my head over the years. And then there were some key moments uh, that I, I actually, I got a whiteboard here to write that I wrote down of things that were stuck in my head. And some of them are just one-liners that came from a, a guy that owns a race team. And I thought, when I look back at all this, there's a they're all tied together. So those people had an impact on me just from me being around them, listening to them talk and wondering, how can we buy engines for $70,000 a piece and burn through two of them in a weekend and then crash cars? And it's, it's just money. It's a drop in the bucket for these people. Mm -hmm. And money doesn't drive me, but it's the generosity. It's being able to do that for people because that's your passion. And just being around that made me think this is what I would love to do for somebody because that, that, that's, what, that's what drives me is, is being able to help people and pass that stuff down that was given to me. Love that. And so when did the transition happen for you? Obviously, these individuals that you were around were talking about real estate, but it sounds like you weren't quite ready to hear the message that they were talking about. When did things change for you when you decided, you know what, maybe I should go and actually pursue this? So probably after being involved with those, with that group of people, it's probably about three or four years. So it'd have been November. I was up on a wolf and deer hunting trip up near Canada with the team. We were deep in the woods in a tent. And on that sad, that following day, I was going to come home and I have to drive through Minneapolis to get home. And I, my, it was our, my fiance and I's anniversary at the time. So she met me in Minneapolis, which is five hours from home. And we were on our way home. We stopped by Cabela's and I'll never forget when we left, she was in her own vehicle because she had to meet me. And I got in my truck and we're driving down the road and it just hit me that I have to go back to work that next, I think it was that next day. And I have a five hour drive ahead of me. So it was, it was a rough time to have a meltdown, but that's what I, I have on my timeline is it's the meltdown that, that really changed me. So mm. I, I thought I can't do this. I'm, I was working at a job that I started in December of 2013 great job to have. I have nothing bad to say about it. awesome people there. It helped launch me to where I'm at today. But that drive home, it was like, I can't do this. I'm unhappy. It's, it's shift work, great pay and all that, but it wasn't enough. There's always been, like I said, that, that storm that has been slowly over the years that I didn't even know was really there brewing inside of me. And then I thought, I have to do something about this. I'm not getting any younger. I got to make a decision and it, it's got to be done now. And there's only been one other time where I had to make a decision like that. And, and I had that same feeling. So I knew it was forever. So I pulled up um, a podcast. I'd never listened to a podcast in my life. Was never interested. I pulled up podcast and I typed in real estate because I thought my background was in construction. If there's one thing that I'm going to understand, it's going to be that. And I don't know how I'm going to get there. And I don't know anything else about real estate other than pounding nails, but I don't, I'm just going to do it. And as long as I never quit, I'll eventually get there. So I pulled up a podcast and it was Rod Cleef's cash flow, Lifetime Cashflow Academy. And I listened to five, about four hours, just under five hours because that was my drive home. 
And on number two, I called Kristen, my fiance behind me. And I said, Hey, I got it figured out. We're going into real estate and we're never looking back. So that was a key moment for me was the meltdown. Well, that's great. And you know, that sets the stage for our conversation moving forward for someone who has that moment in their life where, Hey, a change has to happen. They decide that real estate's the path for them. How did you go about from that moment? What were the steps that you took to build out your team? Uh, you know, uh, early, you know, we've talked before we started recording here that you felt like, you know, one of your superpowers is, is networking and, you know, uh, building partnerships and relationships. And let's talk about how you utilize that skill to help you build your team in the real estate space and ultimately acquire your first commercial multifamily deal. Yeah. So after that time, I really, I started thinking, okay, I could get into this podcast thing. So I started to learn as much as I could on my own. And I remember when we got home that night, it helped lift me up for work the next day. I thought, hey, I've got this distraction that's going to be a good thing. And it helped pull me through work. And I told Kristen that I'm going to study this. I'm going to learn. I'm going to start reaching out to people. I didn't know that there was really net um, like uh, communities on Facebook at that time. I didn't really pay attention to that stuff, but I only knew of the Rod Cleef thing. So I would kind of listen to him and then I would see that there, you know, you, you'd get suggestions. So I started learning what I could on my own. And that following year after that November meltdown, we were in, in Knoxville, Iowa here, which is the Knoxville Nationals. It's the biggest sprint car race. It's like the Super Bowl. Um, and that's when all the, the big drivers are there, you know, the owners and teams and everything. So she told me that night after the race, so she said, Hey, I got you a surprise. Cause I told her that I, I said, I would like to see this Rod Khalif guy. And she said, I got you tickets to this event. And that was an event in Chicago that I think was 2017 or 18 or something like that. So we went to that and, you know, I was hooked. I mean, the, the whole thing was just, you know, I've never, never done drugs before, but it felt like this is amazing. This is three days worth of being around the same people that want the same thing. Like I wanted to just live with everybody, you know, like if we yeah. could all just be in a, the same place together. It was very uplifting because everybody there's, a, there's a, other people there in your shoes and it was overwhelming and seeing the numbers, it's like, how are you ever going to get to that point? And I thought, again, we're just going to keep doing this and we're just going to keep moving forward. So what I found out is the more you get involved in those things, the more you see faces and the more you see faces, the more you remember who's on the same level as you. Who, if you see somebody like I've been going to the gym for years, if I see somebody coming to the gym, I know who they are and I know how bad they want this. Then, I, then I'll start reaching out and helping them or, they, or they'll feel comfortable enough to come and ask me. So I told, um, I think it was, it was probably about a year ago, I told Chris and I said, if there's one thing that anybody would ever, if they're getting discouraged, the one thing that they need to do if they really want to build a team, commit to going at least three consecutive conferences, you know, whatever they are, go to the same ones and you're going to see faces that you remember. And if those people are, they're still showing up, then you start connecting with them. And that's really what we did is like, let's just make every connection that we can and see who's got what. And was there any tactical strategic advice that you would give for someone who is in that space trying to build out a team and uh, is attending these events? Is there any strategic tactical advice that you might give to someone to foster those relationships at those events? Yeah. So really the first thing is just overcoming the the hesitation to not just go meet somebody. They're thinking the same thing you are. I mean, nobody's, nobody, I mean, there's some people after you do it long enough, you're going to get that confidence, but it's practice. You know, we practice everything we do. And the more you practice, the better you get. So you practice going up and meeting somebody, giving them your card and you, you trade cards, you know, make it, make it about a game. How many of these business cards can I get at one conference? And when you go home, you get organized and you have CRM, and you start inputting that information and pretty that's when you find it fun. It's like you're making progress and progress is the real driver. You know, you got you got to make progress to, to really feel like you're going somewhere. And then I think that helps draw people back in. So making sure that you can commit to a few of those conferences in a, in a shorter window. So whether it's consecutively and then seeing how many business cards you can collect. If the first one you got 15, go for 25 and write it down, you know, and have that there in front of you. You get 25, the next one, you go get 40. And then you follow up with them and you get done because people do it. They'll do it for a, about a week or two and they die off. But if you continually hit somebody, just like with my brokers that I have now, my lenders, I started at zero and it wasn't even that long ago. It was only 
a year and a half ago, uh, two years ago, my brokers call me just to see what I'm doing. If I'm in town, hey, you around, you know, this weekend or this week? And and my lenders will call me, just called me uh, a couple of days ago just to see how I'm doing. Hey, you got anything for us yet? They're calling me, you know, asking me for deals. And that's just from the, the relationships that I've built. So use it as a challenge. Like how well can you build these relationships? Can you get them to call you back? You know, to me, that's what I wanted to get to is I want them to want to call me not me needing to call them, have it, have that mutual pull there. You know, aside from, you know, consistency, is there any strategy that you used to get to that point where they would call you back, you know, as you're trying to break through those layers of the relationship to actually get to a place where it's genuine and it's reciprocal versus just the new guy that's trying to make connections? Do you remember any strategies that you implemented to actually break through that or is it just natural for you? Yeah, for me, it's really just natural. Um, you know, when you talk to somebody, you're going to know whether you guys are kind of on the same wavelength and that's going to draw you to each other. And maybe you two will stick together and then maybe bring a third person in. So, you know, the more you can just get involved in anything, whether it's a, a Zoom call or, you know, if you're wanting to learn something like I can remember just faces being on Zoom call, I might not remember their name. But if I'm in a, you know, three or four Zoom calls or a, like some coaching calls or whatever it is, I see them. I'm like, that guy's he's here again. He's showing this is like the fourth time this guy showed up. And then when you notice who's doing it the most, that's who you, you really want to reach out to because you know that they're serious. They're there as much as you are. Yeah. The only way you can see somebody is if you both show up. And that's how it worked for us. That's exactly how we built our team was it happened in Denver at a Denver boot camp. It was it would have been our second boot camp. We met a guy. Uh, I was actually going to go to the bathroom and my fiance, who's, a, who's an introvert. She's more of an extrovert now, but she was an introvert at the time. She's like, well, I want to stand in line and get my book signed. And I'm like, I ain't doing none of that stuff, you know? <laughs> And I went to the bathroom when I came back out, she was talking to a guy and I don't usually would talk about sprint cars at the boot camps because most people don't know what they are, but this guy didn't have to, he was from the Midwest. So it helps when you got somebody from the Midwest and we're out in Denver. So we were sitting there talking and he had, he wasn't going home till the next day. So we stayed together. He, we invited him out with us that night. I, we would started talking. This guy raced non-wing sprint cars. I thought you gotta be kidding me. Like that's nuts. So we ended up hanging out with him most of the night. And when we got back that following week, he said, Hey, would you guys be interested on in being on accountability call? I met somebody at Denver that said they would like to do an accountability call. And I've heard about him now. And I think we probably were one of the first groups to do this and, and maybe, maybe not, but we did this accountability call with about, I think four or five other people and they dropped off, a few of them dropped off, a few of them dropped off. And the last one standing, that's my team now, is everybody that's stuck together. We got our two partners that are married from uh, LA, and then our other two partners are in Champaign, which is the Nick I, guy I just told you about. And then Kristen and I are here in Iowa. And really, it was our Champaign partner, Alan, that just one day after talking for about a close to a year, just said, hey, guys, I don't know, this just hit me today, but we all bring something different to the table. And like, should we go into business together? And we were like, yeah, like, why didn't we think about this sooner? So then we used another boot camp or a conference that was coming up in October of 2018. And then that's when I kind of joined a, a coaching program. And that when we, we actually met up, that was when we met up as partners for the first time. Get your free copy of A Guide to Passively Investing in Commercial Real Estate. Inside, you'll learn the basics of passive income and real estate syndication, what kind of returns you can expect, how to find a sponsor, and how to evaluate the risks. Download your copy in the show notes or visit lifebridgecapital.com forward slash invest better to start your investment journey. And that was in 2018? Yeah, 2018 in Baltimore, yep. And how did you determine who was going to do what and what were the responsibilities as you formalized this team? Yeah, so that was a big thing from the start was really having everything nailed down, have a standard, a standard in the way we operate, a standard in the way that we underwrite and just everything that we're going to do, we wanted a standard for everybody so that we didn't have to leave it up for decision later on. It's like this is our standard. That's what our decision is. It makes the decision process a lot easier as you move forward. So I brought which I didn't think was much, but after several boot camps, I would tell people, I don't have much to bring to the table. I, I can build houses and structures and look at them and, and you know tell you if something needs to be fixed or I can estimate. Well, what I figured out is that most people didn't know that part. And I thought, oh, okay, this is different. And then our, our Alan and Vanessa from California, 
they are very analytical. So he's very good with numbers. He's an estimator. He's a partner in a big painting company out there. He does estimations. And then Nick and Kristen Gaines over in Champaign, Illinois, Nick had already had, I think, maybe like 50 units at the time. So he brought some experience to the table. So he understood a little bit about property management, systems they use, and things of that nature. So you, you combine those together. And we really, to me at the time, it's like, hey, we're, we have like all these little pieces together. And then it was Alan saying, hey, let, let's, let's do this together. And then from that point on, we knew that we needed to sit down together, which is hard. We're all in different areas and have a meeting. Well, there was a boot camp or a conference that, I keep calling boot camp, a conference that following January in LA, which is Alan and Vanessa's backyard, and we met there and we rented like a space, like an office space for a day. And we mapped out everything, our mission statement, everybody's jobs, how we're going to operate, our criteria for deals. We did all of that top and bottom, inside and out so that we knew there was no decisions that needed to be made later on. We would use those to make our decisions for us and just really got organized. And it has been I mean, it's been awesome. Yeah, that's fantastic that you guys took that step and and really, you know, formalize the relationship. You know, some of these relationships can drag on, and and you know, once once you've determined, hey, there is a fit here, you know, taking that proactive approach to actually getting together and really nailing down what the vision was for what you guys were trying to accomplish moving forward. So that was January 2019, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And you acquired your first deal in February of 21. So a year went by from, you know, when you guys met at that conference, you know, uh, we're estimating here. Yeah, to January you, 20, I'm sorry. January 20. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Okay, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So you, you meet in this conference January of 2020. And by February of 2020, a month after this conference, you guys have your first deal, at least under contract. Tell us how that happened. Yeah. So it would have been a year after we became partners because that was October of 2018. Mm. We went through 2019 and it would have been January of 2021. So January 2020 or February 2021 this year was when we actually closed on our first deal. So we were gotcha. partners about a year and a half, something like that before we actually closed on a deal. I um, see. I've got, I've got the dates right now. Okay. Yeah. So Jan January 2020 was the conference. That's when you yep. guys met up. And you closed on it February, 2021. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So, okay. <laughs> Walk us through um, that process then. Cause still going back to that, that's a year's worth of meeting, creating the vision, putting in the effort before you actually got your first deal done as, as a team. Correct. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's right. So there's, I think it's good. And it was also discouraging at times. And that's the one thing people need to realize, you're gonna get discouraged. There's gonna feel like there's times where you're not, it's like, are we really gonna be able to make this happen? Can we really buy a $2 million property or an $8 million property? And you, you have those thoughts, but I quickly dismiss those, which comes from just my, my physical and mental endurance that I've built you know, on myself for years. You get really good after you're looking for deals for a long time and you don't get any of them. And it was also when the market was really went hot, you know, before the pandemic, everything was just hot. So it was very hard to find stuff. So you had to look harder. So for us, even though it was, it took us a long time, I think it was good because it allowed us to keep using our systems before we actually pulled a deal down so that when we were ready to pull one down, it's like, Hey, we're, we're primed and ready on that stuff on the back end stuff. You know, the little things that maybe some people do after they get a deal we are already in such a, a routine and we have our things that we do. We already know that. Now we can focus on really the deal itself. So at that point, when you get those things nailed out between each other, it's, it's calling those brokers. Uh, you got to reach out to brokers. You got to get deal flow. Um, not saying you can't find a good deal that's already listed, but the really good deals are going to come from your relationship that you build with brokers. And you're going to build those by hitting them guys all the time, calling them. Um, guys and gals, you call them weekly. And even if sometimes I won't even call them to talk about real estate. I'll just call to see how they're doing, what they're up to, you know, and things of that nature. And then I speak to them, not all the way, but I speak to them as if they're one of my close buddies. I don't speak in a language that, Hey, we're, you, you got to have a mix of professionalism, but I try to bring it from that very first awkward couple professional calls. And I try to bring them down to you're my buddy that I've known for a long time. I'm going to speak to you like that. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that I'm cussing to him or anything, but you know, I just say, hey, buddy, how are you? You know, how's things going? And, you know, let's get together and we joke and laugh. And 
you know, do that first, because then they're naturally going to feel like, Hey, this, I can talk to this guy any way I want. Like, it's not a awkward professional. Hey, you know, it's just a, it can just be yourself. And when you got to be yourself, you're going to get relaxed. And when you can get relaxed, you concentrate and you still have your, your focus and your clarity. So people need to keep that in mind that, you know, I think it, it's best if you can pull them down to a friendship level instead of treating it more professionally. So the more you do that, now they're going to start wanting to, Hey, I want to help this guy out. You know, I want to throw these people a good deal. And when you start getting good deals, now you got better chances at taking, you know, getting something that's viable to take down. And we looked at a lot. We lost a lot of the offers. I would say, I don't know, we've probably made at least 20 offers, lost all of them at least once. And I started getting on calls in my coaching program and just saying, Hey, at what point do you guys start getting aggressive? Well, at what point do you start shifting some of your standards in order to take a deal down? Because we, we've had some that would have really been actually pretty, looking back, they would have really been good. We're still letting deals like that go. And the reason why is because we're not, we're not in this just to try to make money and get rich quick. This is a long end of life type of thing. Like, you know, can I set my kids up? Can I help my mom retire? Which is one of my main goals, being able to help her retire. She deserves it. And being able to do those little things, if, if you can if you can get yourself set up and find these good deals and just keep working at it, even through the discouragement where it feels like, are you ever going to get one? Stick to your standard. If you do that, the ones that you do get and they fit those standards, then you know that you got a really good chance of making some money for your investors and you're going to sell it to your investors. Yeah, I love that. And you gave some great practical advice there and strategic advice about those calls with brokers. And you know, you guys went a year of putting in a lot of work before you found your first deal. And a lot of those calls with brokers and the relationships about how to have that call with a broker and take it from this, you know, strictly professional level to where you can get on a personal level where they're going to actually think about you when they have a new deal come through their pipeline because they want to help you because they have a personal connection to you. So that's, uh, that's great. I love that. So I'm curious about if you can, and we need to start winding down here a little bit, but I'm curious about the challenges that you guys faced as a team from team dynamics. Were there any challenges that you guys faced in, in formulating this team and figuring out who was going to do what at, at what times and who was bringing what to the table during this you know past year before you took down that first deal? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's hard for me to look at them as challenges. We just worked through uh, the, the challenges is kind of deciding where the capital is going to come from. We have all of us, we'll put you know our own money in. I bring a lot of my network to the table. So I know a lot of people that are wealthy through racing connections that I've made and, and it, they're all in real estate. So they, they would love to get into real estate, you know, with somebody that, that they trust. So, you know, the challenge is just overcoming the hesitation to send out a proposal to somebody that you don't feel like asking for money. You know, it's like your hands out, but yet you got to understand that when you're bringing a good deal to them, they want to invest. There's a lot of money sitting out there. So it's really the, the, the challenge as a team, we don't have any challenges per se in deciding who's going to do what. We just have a weekly call every single Tuesday night at seven o'clock because we have our, our California friends that are you know behind us. So we have to have a later call, but we commit to that. We have that every Tuesday. It's very rare that we miss one. And sometimes, you know, the challenge would be just sometimes you don't feel like getting on that call after a long day and it's, it's seven o'clock our time. And we're on sometimes until, you know, two hours and you got kids, it's 10 o'clock at night. And, you know, I'm an early, early riser, but you just have to remember that this is how you're going to get to your ultimate goal of being able to, you don't have to rely on anybody else for it. You don't have to rely on a job to pay you anymore. And you can give money to other people to help them get to where they want to be. So the challenge is really just being able to commit to those times and making sure that you're available. And once you commit, then it, it, it's easy after you make the commitment because it's just part of your day. It's part of your life. And you don't have to make that decision anymore. I, you know, I've always said that I think the easiest thing to, to make on yourself is make it so you don't have to make as many decisions. And you do that by just, you commit here in between the ears and it's done. This is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to run this train right off the tracks until I'm done. And they put me in the dirt. This is how I'm going to operate. And once you do that, to me, it, it's just, it's just come easy. I, I can't call them challenges, I guess. Yeah. I love that. Well, and that's a, a great mindset to have and, you know, making that decision from day one and then sticking to it 
is what separates uh, you know those that achieve their goals and accomplish what they're set out, setting out to accomplish versus those that get started and stop and then get started again and then stop. And so I love that mindset. Well, Brian, I, I've enjoyed learning about you know your personal story into this space. You know, from the relationships that you built, and the the racing sprint car space, and the moves that you made to to Mesquite, and you know, building those relationships. The meltdown back in I think it was roughly 2013, and how you started that mindset shift and and becoming exposed to real estate and learning about you know rod cleaves program and getting involved there and how you went about building your team through you know attending these networking events and building real relationships with people right building these relationships and then once the relationships are built taking it a step further formal formalizing your team getting clear on your vision and values and what you guys are setting out to do and then executing on that and it hasn't been quick right this has been a long journey for you and uh, but now you've got momentum headed in the right direction. You have a team behind you. You've got your first deal under your belt with another one right around the corner. Congratulations on on that as well. We got to start winding down here. I've got a few final questions for you. The first is, what's one of the daily habits that you've developed that has led to your success? The gym, the gym is uh, the gym is to blame for anything that I got right now. And that decision was made August tenth, two thousand eight. And I made the same decision at that, that time. On, it was on a drive to Nebraska. I made the decision to eat a clean diet. And I've followed that for 13 years, a little over 13 years without a hiccup. I've never missed more than seven days in the gym or my diet. It's just, it's become who I am. I didn't leave it up for decision. It was something that I had to do. And it took a long time again, like this does. But over about five years, I started noticing things that it was doing in between my ears, you know, make it, it made me different uh, in, in, in my head, my mentality. And then that mentality is what brought me to real estate. Ultimately, it gives you that clarity that you need. And, you know, you don't give up on things. You, you push yourself and you challenge yourself and you just don't give up in real estate. It's the same thing. It's not easy. And it's not, you know, it's not a get rich quick thing. It's slow but it's worth it. If you stick to it and you keep showing up to the gym every day, you get fit and then you get mentally fit. If you keep showing up to real estate every day, you start learning and pretty soon you start seeing some things change with your finances and, and just life changes in general. And then you find yourself wanting to give to other people. And that's the real joy of being able to give things to other people. That's what those things fuel me. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, getting up in, in the early morning and getting that knocked out first, first thing in the day really really sets the mind on the right trajectory for the remainder of the day. Um, I agree with that. Another question I've got for you, what's the best source that you have right now for finding new investors? Um, best source would be really when I just sit down and kind of think of all the people that I've made connections with I'm over, you know, my job that I had at, at uh, Monsanto that I was working swing shift there's a lot of people there that's a, it's a good job to have and their retirements are great. So I'm wanting to utilize the self-directed IRA channel that you can use, you know, in order to invest in real estate. I would love to help those guys out because right now some of them guys are taking hits with the market swings that we have. And it's hard to tell s certain people that are a little bit more closed minded, you know, real estate, you can disconnect from the market a little bit by just being an ultra conservative. And everybody says they're conservative, I know, but we're conservative to the point where we've had to let deals go, but now we're just used to, we're numb to it. So it's just being able to, um, you know, think on who's on your list, build that list out and keep thinking of people that you meet and then send it out to them. You'd be surprised that when you send, you might not think that somebody is sitting on some money. <laughs> Visually, they don't look like they probably have much. Some of those guys are the wealthiest guys I've ever come across. So it's just building that list out over time. Somebody pops into your head, you write it down. And you continue to go to different organizational meetups and, you know, like-minded people that are wanting to do the same thing. And that, that's who you kind of build your list out with. People want to get involved. And it's, it shows because I get calls sometimes that are, hey, you got anything in the works that we could invest in? And that's, that's what you want. Yeah. And uh, the, the last question I've got for you, Brian, is, uh, you know, what's the best way for the listeners of the show to connect with you, learn more about what you have going on and, and potentially participate with you in a future opportunity? Yeah. So the best way for me, like I usually like to just talk to people. So um, I don't mind putting my, my number out there. It's um, 319-209-0456. And then my email is 
uh, Brian dot Schaefer. So B R I A N dot Schaefer S H A F E R at Prosper P R O S P E R hyphen R E I dot com. So Prosper R E I dot com. We also have a pro, uh, website, prosperrei.com, uh, that people can go to if they want to see about us. See our current project, uh, the 42 unit that you were mentioned. That's been a complete reposition, so it's kind of fun to see that progress there. And, and that's so people can get a hold of me anytime. I love love meeting and helping where I can. So that's great. We'll have that info in the show notes there. Again, uh, Brian, pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for sharing with our listeners, and I look forward to connecting with you down the road. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate the time, and uh, it was an honor being on here today. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.